has specifically chosen you to be here at this time and in this place. You have incredible potential, purpose, and calling to push back the darkness and be a light for Christ. Stand for nothing and you'll fall for anything. It's time to stand your ground. This is Unapologetic. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unapologetic. I am so honored today to have Jonathan Pitts with us. He is an author, speaker, ministry executive, and pastor at Church of the City in Franklin, Tennessee. For more than 15 years, Jonathan has served in executive leadership roles in Christian media, entertainment, and the church, including executive pastor at Church of the City, executive director at Dr. Tony Evans, the Urban Alternative, manager to recording artist Anthony Evans Jr., and current president for Girls Like You Ministries, a ministry to twin girls and their parents. It includes a magazine, books, and other resources. Jonathan is also a spokesperson for Christian Parenting and a chief strategist for Dunham and Company. Jonathan recently authored My Winter Season, Seeing God's Faithfulness in the Shadow of Grief, a memoir that recaps his journey, seeing God's kindness through the loss of his late wife, Winter Pitts. Jonathan co-founded For Girls Like You and co-authored two books with Winter prior to her sudden passing. The father of four beautiful girls, Jonathan is newly married to Peta Surgeon and continues to see God's kindness unfolding in his life. Thanks for being on, Jonathan. I'm so excited to have you today. Hey, Julie, I'm glad to be with you. And uh, that that bio makes it sound like I'm more important than I actually really am. But uh, it's always <laughs> funny to hear it read back, you know. Yes, it was very impressive. I was like, okay, we need to actually like say all of these things. <laughs> I'm <laughs> like, I'm not that good. I'm just a dude. <laughs> so anyway. No, you you are so impressive. And I mean, so many of us, of course, have followed your family's story and prayed for y'all. And I'm just so excited you're here today. We're going to jump right in by asking the question I ask everyone. What do you wish Christians would stop apologizing for? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think lots of Christians apologize for lots of different things. And I would say for me, um, in this season of my life, uh, I think I wish Christians would stop apologizing for um, maybe how they're made, even like how I opened up this podcast. I'm kind of self-deprecating. I'm always trying to kind of downplay what God's done in my life. Right. And Ephesians 2 sentence says, you've been created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he's prepared in advance for you to do. And yeah. I know that God's wired me a specific way. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of that is like literally being a storyteller, telling my story of what God's done, kind of what I've walked through, which we'll talk about. And Oftentimes I find myself apologizing for the confidence I have in my God and kind of what he's done in my life. And for lots of different reasons now these days, especially for political ones and lots of cultural ones, Mm -hmm. faithful believers are living their faith really quietly and Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily apologizing out loud, but apologizing in action by just basically almost like repenting, turning away from the thing that they actually hold most dear. And um, so I uh, am wanting to stop apologizing for just being who God's called me to be and walking out with full confidence. Um, yeah, his his design for my life, his call for, call on my life. So, Wow, that was a fantastic answer. That was awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so let's just kind of jump right in. I mean, many people listening know your family's story, but can you just tell us your testimony and um, what has been going on in your family in the past few years? Yeah, yeah. So I'll just start just for people that don't know who I am at all. I was just a young guy raised by uh, biracial parents. I'm a biracial kid raised in New Jersey. I met the girl I would fall in love with in college at age 21 and married her. Her name is Winter. And um, quickly decided to move on with life. We got married two weeks after we graduated. Um, She told me early on, I want to go visit my uncle in Texas. We were living in New New Jersey at the time. And we would go visit... uh, And when we went and visited, I didn't realize her uncle basically ran a small town in the south side of (laughs) Dallas called Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, a guy by the name of Tony Evans. And that trip would change my life. I would, um, at that point, was married a little over a year, I guess, that we'd end up actually moving to Texas. And Mm at that point, we had um, about a year and a half, I guess. We had uh, one daughter who was eight months old. We moved to Texas. And um, that all happened because Dr. Evans saw in winter like this skill set. She was a grant writer. He was looking for a grant writer. So anyway, we came to Texas. I came on a one-year plan. Like, I'll try it for a year. If it doesn't work, we're going back to Jersey. And one year rolled into two, two rolled into three, three rolled into seven. 
And it was at year seven where I felt like God um, was really, I, I realized for the first time what he was doing with my life. I was managing Dr. Evans' son, Anthony, managed him for mm-hmm. seven years. Then I ran the Urban Alternative, Dr. Tony Evans' national ministry for seven years. And we had this wonderful, beautiful 14-year season in Dallas of having three more daughters. I have twins that are my youngest, so they're now 18, 15, and twins that are 13. But Okay, I didn't we were, realize that. So now we're yeah. t- totally going to change the topic of today to <laughs> yeah, parents models, with multiples. Just like exactly. Just <laughs> okay. And I'm a okay. multiple. Too. Yeah. I have an identical twin brother. So anyway, what? Multiples all okay. Around. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about all that later. Yeah. Go so, ahead. Continue. <laughs> a- anyway, we had a 14 year beautiful epic journey in Dallas. Uh, Winter uh, had was a grant writer for Dr. Evans for his ministry, and eventually came home with our girls. And uh, in a in a in a place of like frustration, she decided to start um, creating content for our girls. She was like kind of trying to figure out what did God want to do with her life. She was like doing marketing on the side, like doing hair on the side, trying to figure it out. And one day um, she was really frustrated being a stay-at-home mom. And she wrote on a card, scripture that many of you know, um, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Proverbs something, I can't remember. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Mm -hmm. Put on the index card. And about a year later, she just was like, you know what? Like, she just began to be a mom and just fully own where God had her. And um, yeah, about a year later, she would create by accident a magazine called For Girls Like You, which is a magazine for tween girls, by tween girls. She would basically begin to really grow in that, get published and publish multiple different books. And at the end of our 14-year season in Dallas, I felt called, we felt called to Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I was looking for what God had next for me, and an opportunity opened up to, to be executive pastor at Church of the City, and we just felt like Franklin was the, Franklin in Nashville was the great place for us because of her publishing career and what I was doing, and at the end of the day, um, July 14th, sorry, July 24th, 2018, I was finishing up my last week of work for Dr. Evans. We were already bought, we had already bought our house in Franklin, already got our girls into school, and I came home from a day at work to a guest house we were staying in, from a family guest house we were staying in, friends of ours, family of ours. And um, uh, as fast as these words are coming out of my mouth, Winter was taking a nap, and um, I walked into the bedroom to floss my teeth because I had eaten ribs for dinner, Costco ribs, which I'll never eat again. Mm-hmm. And um, as fast as these words are coming out of my mouth, um, Winter went into like a cardiac episode and would really suddenly and really traumatically for my family, my three old, my three youngest girls were there at the time. Um, she would glide into eternity, super tragic and sudden for us and traumatizing and super, um, yeah. peaceful for winter. Cause she would, her heart would stop. She would just lose consciousness. And by God's grace, um, without a lot of, um, pain, uh, glide into eternity. And as you can imagine, um, changed the course of my life. I all of a sudden became, a widow. My girls became, um, at least on this earth, motherless daughters, although they still have a mother, obviously, but um, mm-hmm. their life changed, my life changed, and I found myself a dad having to lead four girls at that point, age 14, 11, and my twins were nine, um, through, yeah, maybe the hardest thing that will ever happen to them. I don't know. You know, it's just like, it's such a painful thing. And so what's crazy is God literally... Um, he brought us to a place that I call an incubator for healing. Franklin, Tennessee is an incubator for healing. We'd already bought our home. The girls were already in school. And the church that I was coming to serve, I hadn't started my job yet. I was to start that next week. And oh Darren goodness. Whitehead, my, my now boss, said, hey, if you want to go back to Texas, we'll we'll sell your house. We'll get your stuff back. But um, if you come, you'll find a family ready to adopt you. And mm. the church has adopted us. My role's changed. Lots has happened in that time. But God's been really faithful to us in that time. And uh, we've been healing ever since, you know, I think healing from a loss like that, um, especially for girls, for, you know, for a child, um, is going to take, I guess, the rest of your life, you know, because you don't, none of that's reconciled fully until eternity, you know, our losses mm-hmm. aren't fully reconciled till eternity, but God's been good. We've healed. Um, I, uh, a couple of years into that journey, um, was introduced um, to an incredible godly woman who had become my best friend and my now wife. Her name is Peta. And for the last eight months, we've been blending a family, which is a whole nother crazy journey I never thought I'd be on and have probably more compassion and empathy for families walking through um, similar circumstances that I never would have thought about before. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, that's who I am. That is My girls, by the so way, are now powerful. Eight, yeah, 18, 15, and twins are 13. So I have four teenage girls in my house right now. And that's a whole So that's story. another prayer request. That's like yeah. a separate... Okay. Another story. <laughs> I remember... Yeah, I remember whenever... <clears throat> the news came out about winter because I, I remember where I was. I was just praying for y'all and praying for those girls. Mm. I I wanted <sighs> – thank you for sharing that. Like I, 
I really appreciate just how transparent you are and how open y'all have been in grieving and in celebrating the new, obviously the new chapter that you're in. I know you said off air, of course, this is not something that you thought you had experienced. This wasn't what you thought would happen in your life. And recently, I mean, I am hearing about a lot of loss just with couples that are are younger and yeah. they are getting remarried and of wondering really how how do how do they do that? Do you have just your best advice for parents with children and they're they're experiencing grief but the parents also of course grieving how, how do you lead a family while also doing your own of course healing yeah. well uh, i would say that I, I don't care how you've gotten to the point where you're blending a family or how you've like nobody gets there because they want to get there right and i would just say um you know i love when the bible the bible's so true and beautiful and wonderful like there's a scripture i never understood that i would actually as a pastor even uh, i wasn't in the pastoral role as a leadership role of the church but as a guy walking with volunteers and people through life mm -hmm. and death i would quote the scripture we don't grieve as those who have no hope right. and that was like something i got intellectually that i now have experientially because the grief that I've had, I've walked through with absolute hope. And what's hard is like cognitively, there's so many things I've known that I've had to experience and even wrestle through the reality that those things aren't actually fully true until eternity. But, you know, in walking through loss, like I knew scripture. I know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I know that, you know, um, there's a scripture I memorized because I used to be afraid of um, flying and it's uh, have no fear of sudden death or disaster uh, that overtakes the wicked for the Lord will be at your right side and will keep your foot from being snared. I used to think that scripture was about like God keeping you from death. And now I know that scripture is even in death, you won't be snared. Like your life will wow. be not snared. Like you'll be with God if you love Jesus, if you trust him, like you'll be with him forever and eternity, which is what we believe as believers. Like that's the ultimate thing. And so we don't grieve as those who have no hope because that, that reality but there are things I've had to walk through that are a reminder to me that I am human and that my girls are human. And grief, I would say, is um, basically dealing with lost expectations. And we all deal with that differently. And I've had to learn to be a dad who's patient with my girls when they've grieved differently than me. They've had to learn to be girls that have to be patient with me when I've grieved differently than them. And there's five of us. Well, there are five. There's now six with my wife. Um, but the reality is we've all grieved differently. We've all had to be patient with each other. We've all had to day by day enact the gospel, meaning forgive, slow to anger, quick to listen, um, uh, quick to, uh, to, you know, slow to open our, our mouths. Like there's all these things we've had to actually enact. And that only happens in the process of having to do it. And so I think we've all learned to be more faithful believers because of what we thought walked through the loss yeah. we've walked through. And, um, the only thing I can say is, you know, I was just reading the scripture, like, uh, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who remains in me will bear much fruit. Like, in my abiding in Jesus, my remaining in Jesus, I've become better as a man. I've become better as a husband, mm -hmm. more faithful as a father. And when I don't abide, I've not done some of these things really well. And so I would just say abide because I feel like God, um, through the Holy Spirit, will give you wisdom for the days that you need it, even when it feels almost impossible. And I've had many yeah. days that feel impossible. Like, I want my girls to be happy and they might not be happy about a decision I've made and I can't help that. And uh, even like you, th you mentioned um, grieving well, but also celebrating well, like the hardest thing for me to do, um, even when I was getting married, like entering my new marriage was just choose to celebrate because there's so much grief. There's so much sadness. There's so much right. loss. And that's not just for me. I mean, I lost uh, a wife. My girls lost a mom and then uh, brothers lost a sister and cousins lost a cousin and uncles lost a niece. You know, it's just like, you're having to walk through something and what you realize is there are layers of grief all around. So how do you walk through that? How do you honor where you've been, what you've had, and then also celebrate what God's done in your life, which is new. And that's in lots of facets of our life, but probably in marriage, it's, it's much more because oneness is such a big deal. Like when that, the only way oneness ceases to be oneness in a way that God would, um, it's not even want because death, he doesn't want death, but the only way it happens the most, I don't even know who used the word naturally, but you know, Bi the Bible says, this is what I believed as a husband. Mm -hmm. um, when I gave my vows, which said, until death do us part, like I gave that vow because that was the only thing I knew that could separate us that was that was ultimate. And um, right. so anyway, I'm talking a lot in circles and throwing out scriptures, but the reality is, you know, like 
when you when you do a thing like honor a vow, like I love my wife faithfully, not perfectly, but faithfully, and then that thing ends, um, you can walk forward knowing fully confident that God's got your back and God's got your future and God can help you celebrate even when it's hard and he can help you honor your past even when that gets more it's so complicated like family mm-hmm. blending is such a complicated thing and so mm-hmm. i've got ultimate respect for people walking through it now and yes. um probably more questions than answers to be honest but mm-hmm. i know there's a faithful god that's leading me every day and in that i can smile and rejoice so so i just get this sense that you're very open with your daughters i would think that a lot of dads would think they had to kind of more be strong or not let their daughters necessarily, or children necessarily know what's going on with them as a parent. I just wonder how do you how do you balance, or how did you balance, walking through your own healing? Like, did did you let them know when you were having a hard time, or when things were difficult, or was that something that you kind of had to work on with you and God? Yeah. I mean, I think the thing that I've learned that I'm trying to do more faithfully is understand my own motivation for why I'm doing what I'm doing. So if I'm sharing okay. with them because I actually believe it'll benefit them, okay. then I then I share. But if I share with them out of a need to – like at one point I had like almost like a codependent relationship with my girls where if they were happy, I was happy. If they were sad, right. I was sad. And so that would manipulate what I would want to share with them. And I got to the point where I was like, okay, that's not working. God forgive me for like needing them to be some way for me to be happy. Um, And once I got there, it allowed me to question my motivation and then move forward in terms of what I share and how I share it. And also just more than sharing, even be willing to listen to them, which I feel like I'm now better at than I ever have been of just preferring myself less and preferring them more. So asking how they feel and not needing them to answer a certain way, you know, yeah. uh, there's a story I tell, um, my oldest daughter at one point, she, and she told this story, that's why I'll tell it, um, publicly, but, uh, she was in her bed and, uh, kind of covers over her head and was just like, you know, not want to talk. I'm like, Hey, are you okay? This was like nine months after her mom passed away. And, mm-hmm. uh, she didn't want to talk. I'm like, Hey, like, just talk to me and just tried to convince her to talk to me. Finally, she goes, dad, I'm having a hard time believing that God is good. He's real. And if he's real, I'm having a hard time believing he's good. And I took that as such a affront to my faith and me as a pastor and as a dad. And um, I held that ground for about 30 minutes trying to convince her of why God was real and why he was good. Instead of just being compassionate and sitting there with her in that, as which would probably have been more of a godly thing to do that would actually prove God's goodness. Um, and I had to, I repented of that. And that was like a big step for me because the reality was that was showing my motivation was more about me than about her and her needs. And so anyway, I've just learned over time. And what's hard is that loss and difficulty is probably the best teacher. And none of us want to walk through any of that, but I've learned more in this right. than I've learned in my successes. So for that, I'm, oh. I'm, I'm grateful, but I'm still learning and trying to figure out even as they grow, like what to share, what not to share. And I really pray for wisdom mm-hmm. daily on that because um, sometimes it's something's true that's not necessarily a good thing to share because of where they are and they're all different. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's complicated. <laughs> parents is complicated. Absolutely. Yes. Well, I just know, I mean, I have heard different parents talk about that. And I mean, people kind of want to know, like, what am I supposed to tell them? What am I not? And really there's more of a push towards authenticity and being real. But then that can, of course, hinder your own healing or the child's. I want to go back to something you said because I I really have seen this a lot with Christian parents where a child is wrestling with a spiritual truth and you're Mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, that was heretical. Like, oh, don't say that. Don't say it out loud or that, you know, it makes us uncomfortable if a child or someone in our ministry says something that's not biblical or that is Mm. incorrect. And I love that story you just told, but can you talk about that just a little bit more of why it's important? And really there's a biblical basis for it of sitting there with the person and processing versus immediately correcting theology. Yeah. Well, I think it's biblical because we think about, uh, and it's always I'm always trying to make sure I get the characters right, but it was Jacob who became Israel, who wrestled with God, which is what literally the name means. It's just like wrestling with God is literally probably the most biblical thing we can do because it actually means we're acknowledging his presence and we're acknowledging Mm -hmm. that he's there. And, you know, when we actually wrestle, it kind of changes us in in, in a way. And I think I've been that parent. I've been that man who's been more 
protective of his own image and what everybody else thinks about how faithful I am than about like mm-hmm. actually the people in front of me, like even my daughters. And so it's important they wrestle because if they, it's, you know, even like think about my journey, like I grew up in a Christian home and I knew Jesus from like, I don't remember a day where I didn't know Jesus, but I'll tell you what, I got to college and I made some decisions that weren't godly. And the only thing that met me that was comforting was God's grace. And that mm-hmm. changed me. I was, I was a new man when I realized that God still loved me. He was still mm-hmm. gracious towards me, even in my biggest mistakes. And yeah. I want that to be true for my girls. And if you can't be honest with God, like it's, it's kind of a non-starter if you can't be honest. And so right. I don't know, it's probably the thing that I would love to keep teaching my girls is to be, to be honest with the Lord, be open yeah. before him and to wrestle with him because it's actually um, a benefit to your own soul. Like God is, um, right. he's a good father, you know, like mm-hmm. I can't remember the scripture exactly. I think it's in Matthew, maybe a couple of the gospels where it says like, like God's a good father. Like he wouldn't give you a stone when you ask for bread or like what it's yeah, got right. a couple different references. Mm-hmm. Like there's just a reality that he's, he's really good. And if you show up humble as a child, ready to receive, he's going to, even in your wrestle, he's going to, he's going to show you his goodness. And so, yeah. Well, not that you need it from me, but I just want to completely commend you for how you're doing this. It just sounds like you're a fantastic dad. And I mean, that really is a situation you just never would imagine that you're having to walk through. But I mean, you're doing such a good job. And (laughs) I want to, I mean, it's evident because one of your girls has now announced that she feels like she's called to ministry. So can you tell us a little bit about what that's like and how you're leading her and encouraging her? Yeah, well, first I want to ask, like, did she post something on social media I haven't seen? Because I'm like, I don't even know what it is. But, I mean, I know that she's called oh, to ministry. Oh, I thought, yes. Okay, well. She, she might have. Back. And, by the way, I've always known, it's probably Alina, my oldest, she's always been called to ministry. And okay. I don't I don't know what that means in terms of, like, vocational or not vocational. Okay. She's been, a, she's been an actress. She's sang. She's done all these different okay. things. But I, I appreciate you commending me uh, most days. I felt like an epic failure as a father because the cool thing about kids, especially teenagers, is they basically reflect back to you what you're doing. And so in them, it's like the clearest picture of probably your brokenness in humanity is what your kids Mm -hmm. present to you. So on many days, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I wish I was doing a better job. But I know like I I know I'm by God's grace doing a decent job with my girls. And Mm -hmm. I've had some actually really sweet moments. My oldest daughter who just she's actually traveling uh, Europe right now. Before she left, where she said some things that were really encouraging that I was surprised by, you know, and mm-hmm. maybe that's the good news when you're when your teenage kids like share something really good with you. So anyway, this is you're now hearing oh, like my own internal struggle and process with <laughs> teenage girls. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've just really tried like as it relates to calling the ministry and all that. Like I've always tried to relate to my girls that whatever they do, like mm-hmm. they are marked by God. They're marked by the Holy Spirit and wherever they go, they are going to be representing him. We are his ambassadors, you know? And um, so anyway, wherever they end up in the world, I know my girls will be ambassadors for Christ. Not perfect people, but ambassadors, which there's no perfect ambassadors, but um, the only perfection is in his grace. So just grateful for that for, for me and for them. So. So I want to talk about the, for girls like you, ministry, because I, we've been in student ministry for 13 years and definitely... Now, basically, I know about toddlers and teenagers. I don't know about (laughs) anything in between, but I mean, we really, we love teenagers. I invited my husband to church when we were 14. That's when he got saved. I was definitely called to ministry as a tween, not as a teenager, um, when I was 11. And that is just such an important age. And Mm -hmm. you have continued Winter's ministry, I, you helped her start it. Y'all, y'all were in that together, but it's it's continuing. And I, I told you I wanted to talk to you about this because I do keep ending up in conversations where people are just a little hesitant. They're like, why does why do we need to have something for teenage girls? Why do we mm. need to have a specific ministry or specific resources? Um, there there is some hesitancy and question around that. We're all for it. I was a girls minister for five years. But can you just speak to that of what why is it really important that that ministry for that group? Yeah. Well it's interesting because I would say um, instinctively when Winter passed away I knew I was to carry on that ministry, partly for her legacy. Like Mm -hmm. when we create things on earth that benefit the kingdom, like that is our legacy, whether it be our children or whether it be something else for that matter. So I knew I was called to carry it on. But what's funny is over the last couple of years, and it's grown, like we've gone from like 
1,200 subscribers to the magazine to nearly 6,000 subscribers to the magazine. It's continuing to grow. We're continuing to develop partnerships. Yeah. But what's funny is I became a little bit of a skeptic. Like, is this important? Is this important? Mm-hmm. And what I've really recognized really over the, even the last couple of months um, is every single outlet in culture right now is trying to tell our girls who they are. It's trying Absolutely. to give them identity. And it's really, you know, um, I I've, I believe our girls are, are – um, being hit with it the most right now. And it's super confusing, whether it be around sexuality or whether it be around mm-hmm. like even them, their purpose as, as, as actually a, a type of a human being as a girl, like they're being attacked from so many different directions. And so yeah. I believe now more than ever that if you have all these different people trying to speak false identity to our girls, mm-hmm. how much more should we as believers be speaking true identity to them? And so for girls like you, it started Winterhead, like this picture, this image of like, helping little girls see in other regular girls doing big things for God, like yeah. almost an image of themselves and what they can be. And so we just right. continue to do that. We continue to like um, share stories of girls doing big things for God that are just regular girls. Like my daughter, Alina, uh, my oldest girl was in War Room, the movie War Room. If you've ever seen it, mm-hmm. if you haven't seen it, you should check yeah. it out. It's an awesome movie on prayer, um, a top 10 Christian box office movie. And she's a regular girl that got this tremendous opportunity and got to shine mm-hmm. for the Lord in this film and lots of ways since then. But what little girls need to know is she's just like they are. And in mm-hmm. Christ, super powerful to do big things. And our girls need to know their identity and who they are and who God's created them to be. Yeah. And we just get to be a small voice uh, in doing that. Um, but I love uh, leading the ministry. I feel like I'm a father to it. Like I've got yeah. teenage girls now who are kind of aging out of our resources, but I continue to do it as a dad because it's like another child that God's given me and something I'm really mm-hmm. grateful to continue to steward. And um, I found real purpose in, uh, real mission in, and also real trust because it's been a, a big journey of like trusting that God's going to continue to do it and provide. Right. And I've watched mm-hmm. him like supernaturally provide for us in ways that like, I'm like, there's no way that was anything but God, you know? So right. Yeah. It's been fun. And so, I mean, this is a good time. So with Girls Like You, is it, it's a magazine. How how do parents who are like, let's see that, go, oh, we need that. We need that immediately in our home. How how do they connect to that ministry? Yeah, just simply go to forgirlslikeyou.com, like F-O-R, mm-hmm. forgirlslikeyou.com. We've got a bi-monthly subscription magazine for tween girls. Um, I would say a mature six or seven-year-old all the way up to Really, I just found out uh, last week uh, a woman I know has a 16-year-old daughter who still reads it. But it's really for tweens. Uh It's probably between like 10 and 12 would be like our wheelhouse. Um, But we've got the magazine, but then we've also got other devotionals and resources for girls from uh, devotionals, coloring books, um, Mm -hmm. back-to-school journals, prayer books, like all kinds of things. Uh, Winter Before She Passed Away published eight different resources for girls. My four daughters have done six fictional books, uh, three in combination with uh, their mom that Alina did, and then three after Winter Passed Away. And so I've got a bunch of resources, uh, not only for kids, but also for parents as well. So we have a parenting book called um, She Is Yours, Trusting God As You Raise the Girl He Gave You, which Winter and I co-wrote. Wow. um, Anyway, yeah, for girlslikeyou.com, you can subscribe there. And thanks for, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Well, and I think I hear a lot of Christians, they're, they're just very upset about what's going on in culture. They're very scared, and we can say it on here so far. We're still allowed to say stuff like this. Uh, but, I mean, they're worried about transgender and worried about what's going on. But it's almost like more of a I'm scared or I'm complaining or it's like, well, you also can actually go on the offense and – try to help this age group or try to help the daughter in your life or the girls in your life. And so I just think that that's a neat thing about your ministry is instead of just cowarding in fear, like, oh my gosh, this world is just going, you know, in the wrong direction of realizing we really can be an influence and we can help change the conversation and really influence girls in that way. Thank you for doing that. I just want to say those magazines are very fun to read as Mm. someone who has been in church her whole life. Some resources just are not that fun and they're not very kid friendly or they're not written for really the age group, honestly, that they're trying to reach. And so Mm -hmm. I just want to say, having seen the magazine and read it, that For Girls Like You is very much literally for the girls that it's trying to reach. So it really is a fantastic research uh, resource well, and ministry. Well, thank you. Yes. I mean, you know, going back to what you said about fear, like God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And mm-hmm. every one of us, what, what what's not new is the fact that the world has been going the direction it's going. Um, right. So what we get to do is actually walk in love, walk in 
power given to us by the Holy Spirit. And Mm -hmm. yeah, for our girls, for our families, uh, for the kingdom, and for those that don't know, like there are so many girls that don't know Jesus, don't know his direction for their life. And we get to like in paper form, like just get a magazine to the hands of a girl who doesn't know like what God's done for her. And so we try to be as like fun as possible. We call it edutainment. So we're educating them and entertaining Mm -hmm. them at the same time. Our editor in chief, her name is Roberta, and she's super creative and lots of fun. And yeah. her, the joke section is her favorite part of the magazine. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, thanks for the thanks for the plug. Yeah, the it's magazine. fantastic yeah. for sure. We're we're closing up, but I just I'm thinking about different families I know, and they haven't seen the the remarriage. They haven't seen the new mom or the mm. new wife come in, and they really are still in that grieving. Um, trauma like this is new this is a new season they're in how do they navigate it can you just can we just end with like your best encouragement to that parent that really is going through something that they never expected to go through yeah I mean it's it's so hard because everybody's circumstance is different and I'm I'm mentoring a guy right now who lost uh, his wife has four girls and I mean I just think about it's so hard to speak specifically to people that have walked through very different things but the one thing I would say is like literally just stay close to the Lord um, because I really do think he speaks very specifically to us. One of the things, uh, Philippians 4, 8 is a verse that really spoke to me in my loss, which is uh, many would call the discipline of celebration. Uh, Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is honorable, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, excellent or praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Think about these things. Mm-hmm. Like you have the mind of Christ and the reality is you get to think about all that's true and beautiful and right and pure. And like, you get to pay attention to what God's doing. My mentor, Tony Evans always says, if what you see is all you see, you'll never see all there is to be seen. So somehow in your grief, wow. in your trauma, in your loss, God is still speaking. God is still showing up. God is still revealing redemption. And that's true for me. Like I think about my story and my loss. I never thought like I would have what I had in terms of like, relationship and marriage and all that. And God's like totally redeemed my life from the pit in terms of like even that. And yeah. doesn't mean everybody has to get married again, right. like in your loss. Doesn't mean that your kids are ever going to have, a, you know, it's just, it just means that God can redeem. And he oftentimes mm-hmm. does that. Well, he always does it through other people in our lives. And mm-hmm. so I would just say like, be expectant for God to show up, ask for him to show up, look for where he's showing up. And when right. you see it, just say it, like call it out, celebrate right. it, thank him for it. Like, Whatever's true, whatever's right, whatever's honorable, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, dwell on Mm. these things and then speak about them because they are true. And you'll encourage yourself in that and God will encourage you in that. So that is so good. And write them down because there are things that you think you're always going to remember. Like our story was different, but we went through a lot of loss and fear and trauma. And uh, you you think you're always going to remember how those stories of how God showed up and those really special things. But I mean, Deuteronomy talks about writing things down so you can share them with your kids. And there really is something powerful in that. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Like I'm just thinking of so many people that I hope tune in and really feel hope again and yeah. know that their story, there's another chapter and that God hasn't left them. And so I really, I really appreciate that you are speaking into these issues, into these topics, because it really, it really is so important for people to know that there's hope and that God is with them, even in things that are unexpected. Can you tell our listeners and viewers just how to stay connected to you and to your ministry and where to find your books? Yeah. Well, I did write a book, speaking of chapters, my winter yeah. season, winter with a W, or sorry, with a Y, obviously a W, my winter season, seeing God's faithfulness in yeah. the shadow of grief, um, which you can get books wherever they're sold, get that book wherever books are sold. Um, For Girls Like You is probably the best place. I kind of stay in contact at For Girls Like You is all of our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, yeah, that's probably the best way to keep in touch with me. And then PittsJR26 is my Instagram, my personal one which I also share on there as well. And um, yeah, they can find me there. But just Google me, you'll find me. Not because I'm great, but just because there's a lot about my story out there. So anyway, Yeah. yeah, appreciate it, Julia. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on. Yeah, God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to Unapologetic. Remember that you can listen to today's episode and more wherever you get your podcasts and at ptv.org slash Julia.